Okay, welcome to our continuing discussion of um, post-classical China. And remember, this corresponds with the note sheet that you were given in class a while back when we talked about the um, earlier dynasties, especially post-Han, and how do we get up to then the post-classical era, and especially the Golden Age under the Tang and the Song dynasties. Um, so you can see um, that uh, the Tang then stretched out into Central Asia and established uh, one of the larger uh, territory holdings um, of post-classical China. So <clears throat> remember some background here of the founding of the Tang. So as the Sui uh, started to crumble, uh, Li Yuan, the Duke of Tang, I think he was called, uh, fought against the Sui king and then established his dynasty. And one of the strongest leaders of the time is um, the Taizong Emperor. Um, the civil service examination was perfected, right, which will remain then part of the Chinese um, administration, uh, government administration until the 20th century. While theoretically it was for everyone, right, uh, who was smart, but obviously only the aristocrats could spend the time to study and pass these exams. Um, over the centuries, right, this system will become corrupt um, and uh, aristocrats will help their children um, maintain their uh, connection to the imperial administration. Um, also then creating then the scholar gentry, right, who will then um, run the government. Um, this was also, as we looked at the map, a period of the greatest military expansion, right, stretching all the way to Afghanistan. Um, in the Tang, they had a fairly liberal attitude towards uh, all the religions, and we've talked about the growth of um, Buddhism, right, as it comes and spreads through China. Um, and it's the golden age of foreign relations with other countries. Um, <clears throat> And we see them stretch and um, incorporate some of these areas culturally or in, um, under their influence, right? When we were talking about Japan, they would send emissaries to the Tang court, um, and they were all able to maintain good relations, at least for China. So uh, under the Tang um, dynasty, you can see the imperial um, organization um, very much um, which would keep then this dynasty and others lasting for a long time right as they organize the affairs to uh, have it run smoothly um, so here are some pictures if you recall of some of the great Tang achievements um, so new technologies printing remember on the wood block printing and um, this is from a uh, Buddhist text, one of the earliest printed books, 868 CE. Um, porcelain, right, refined. Here is a good example of some Tang porcelain. Uh, Gunpowder is uh, discovered. Uh, mechanical clocks. As they um, stretched out to Central Asia, they reestablished the safety of the Silk Road travel and uh, tea comes into China from Southeast Asia and there's kind of some legends surrounding how did they figure out how to make tea but um, right in modern times tea will be and porcelain will be two of the main products from China that the Europeans will seek after um, so Buddhism then starts to grow um, this is the White Horse Temple, which is, according to the tradition, the birthplace of Chinese Buddhism. Um, but if you recall from our conversation of Buddhism a while back, there were the two rafts, you know, the two groups of Buddhism, um, and Mayayana, the large raft, meaning that it could, um, is for everyone, right? And this idea of Buddha becoming more of a figure to um, save people. Uh, started to grow in uh, China, and it was known as Pure Land Buddhism. And here are some uh, statues in the Hainan province in China. Under the Tang era, they were carved into the mountain. 
pretty cool. Uh, we also see then um, Chan Buddhism, or as it's known in Japan, Zen Buddhism. And this was kind of this ascetic um, way of living, of contemplating beauty and its impermanence. And it was definitely for the elite, right, who had time maybe to ponder these things in their rock gardens. And we also see the rise of monks, right, taking a political role at court. And this <clears throat> will cause some trouble for Buddhists later on. Um, in the midst of the Tang, there was kind of this break when we had um, the Empress Wu Zetian. Um, she will be the only female empress to rule alone. And she would look for smart people to come to her court. Uh, she also oversaw the construction of new irrigation systems. And we also see the rise then of Buddhism as the favored state religion um, and the growth of then uh, many Buddhist temples paid for by the state. But unfortunately for her, she sometimes picked bad people to work for her. And so that will lead to her unpopularity. Um, here's a portrait of her, but it was from the 18th century. And then this is uh, her tomb. Okay, so as... Tong experienced some political troubles. Um, I think Buddhists start to take the brunt of that, especially over um, a rival empire in Tibet, which will become um, a Buddhist kingdom. And so as they then try to um, expand their territory, um, this would lead to inflation, right? and unstable um, or instability in the Tang Dynasty. And so Buddhism is blamed um, and there's kind of this uh, call to go back to Confucian beliefs and we kind of see this cycle through periodically through China. Um, and unfortunately for the ladies, right, um, they had a lot of freedom under Buddhism, um, but as the Tang become more and more anti-Buddhist, um, their freedom will then suffer. Um, but this is from the time period, and it shows kind of the these two Buddhist monks, right? Here's one with blue eyes, and it shows, I think, part of the problem for Buddhism is that they saw it as a foreign religion and not native to China. Another aspect of Tang China was this uh, practice of foot binding. So we'll give you a moment to ponder those pictures. Um, but this was seen as um, a prestige of the uh, wealthiest people in China. Um, and so starting at uh, a young age, they would start to kind of bend the toes underneath and, and then would bind them up with cloth so they could create these tiny feet, which was considered appealing. Um, and so here's some women with, uh, can you see how small their feet are? And so if you have feet like this, can you work in the fields, right, or go to the market? No. So this was kind of a sign of your wealth and your status. Um, here's some evidence there of another shoe. Um, and then just to give you an indication of how long the practice of feet binding, notice this is a color photograph, right, of a woman showing what her foot looked like after it had been you know, as she had kept it bound. Um, people periodically through China will try to stop this practice, but it ultimately will come to an end in the 1950s when um, the People's Republic of China is established under Mao Zedong. So, you know, think about it. Uh, ladies, why do we do this to each other and to ourselves? For beauty, I guess. Um, so, as uh, the Tang st again starts to crumble, we see kind of these three states emerge in China. Um, so we have the Tibetan, right, the Katan, um, and the Song. And so eventually the Song will prevail. Um, however, as we saw, they'll have to do some interesting things to keep these guys at bay. Um, they will pay them and bribe them and stuff to maintain their authority. But we look at the golden age of China under the Tang and the Song. So what were some of the um, accomplishments of the Song dynasty? We're going to look at them in the next few slides. 
Um, so here's the founder. Um, and your book opens up with a description of um, the urban environment of the song, and which creates a continues a sophisticated um, uh, society. And we also see then the growth of this urban merchant and middle class. China also under the song. Oh, excuse me. There's the founder. Um, <clears throat> under the song makes the magnetic compass, which makes China great sea power. And we see the establishment of the Chinese junks, these massive ships that would sail around uh, in Asia. And this is a comparison to uh, one of the sh size ships of Christopher Columbus, right? So even though that was a big deal for the Europeans in modern history in the 1400s, look what it, look at it stack up to the Chinese junks. Okay, so another important development, we talked about the woodblock printing under the tong, but under the song, they did movable type printing, which um, made books easier to print, right, and books became cheaper, which increased education. When the Europeans figure this out in the 1400s, we start to see then modern history begin. Um, we also see the revival of the landscape painting, um, something unique to China. And when we were looking at the art of Japan, we can see the influence there. But anyway, I think that's pretty awesome. And of course, porcelain then further refined under the song. Calligraphy, also a great form of art. Um, and this is a famous calligrapher from this time period. Um, China also, or under the song, I should see, as they became um, further established in trading and the growth of the middle class, they had the first use of paper money. Uh, they called it flying money. Uh, however, at times that will cause some inflation. And remember, your book begins, your chapter begins with Hangzhou, um, the description of how people could shop in that uh, city w and buy goods from all over the world. And so that's something you and I are used to today, but can you imagine them doing it um, in the medieval times, but in China? Um, and the description of the canals and the bridges. So as it becomes more urbanized, right, we see the increase in public services, uh, road building, other things that we would take as normal today. Um, however, the song also saw sort of a, a continuation of the anti-Buddhist um, movement and um, back to then uh, Confucian, Neo-Confucian ideas, right? So they go back to Chinese values uh, and as they bring up Confucius philosophy, Buddhism then takes the slide. Um, and last, of course, importantly, is under the song, we see then massive rice cultivation throughout China. And there's a cool picture of rice cultivation, but obviously not during the Song Dynasty. Okay, so there you have it, the golden age of China under the Tang and Song Dynasties. And we see some of these inventions and innovations um, that are still hundreds of years away in in the West. Um, but like the Islamic empires that we just finished discussing, these are some of the unique attributes of Chinese civilization that they will then share with the rest of the world.